You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 87 of a Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I'm joined by my co-host, Connor Johnnan. David got lost on Long Island. Did I say that right? Long Island? I don't know how to do the New England Yankee accent. So he will not be joining us today, but soon he will return soon enough. Today, though, we are joined by Ray Sumner, who is a PhD candidate at Colorado State University. Go Buffs. Ray, have you uh, recovered from uh, Plains Anthropologist all right? I'm uh, pretty much recovered. It it was a rough time down there, a little bit hanging out in Boulder. But no, it was a great time. It's good to see everybody, obviously, after the year break from COVID last year. So it's good to get back out, talk uh, with the rest of the Plains archaeologists, anthropologists, and uh, see the other students from different programs around the country that work in the Plains. Yeah, man, we had a decent amount of students this year, a whole crew from like Wichita State. I thought LaBelle would have brought the CSU crowd out again, but it was just grad students this year. Yeah, we had a couple undergrads, but uh, that snuck in for just a few few sessions. But uh, yeah, for the most part, it wasn't as uh, robust as we've had. I think COVID's, we're still all recovering from COVID getting the new yeah. undergrads involved. It's been a little more challenging than it used to be. Absolutely. So I've known about you, Ray, since Plains Bloomington, and I was blown away by your student paper presentation because I'd never heard someone talk about your research in a light that gave Plains Indians credence to military intelligence. And so I've been, I've been fascinated with your work and following it closely. And it's awesome to have you just up the road. And we, we run in very similar circles here in the state. So we're really excited to have you, have you on tonight. Connor, you didn't overlap with Ray at CSU at all, right? I don't think so. I think I had, I ended in 2014. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. When did you start? I started my MA in 2016 in history, so we've been a couple years after. So yeah, yeah. okay. I moved yeah, back just, to Korea to the states in 2014. But it's it's nice to have a fellow Ram on here because we have to deal with Mr. Buff over here all the time. And <laughs> all just, the time. It's just absurd, you know. It's just it's good to have another uh, CSU Ram on. Uh, well, at least fortunately this year, neither of us can talk about our uh, football teams. <laughs> no, I, Boulder never can talk about its football team. We're not good at all. Um, but anyway, so like Ray, you know. You're an archaeologist, you're a PhD candidate in anthropology. So what were your first experiences in anthropology growing up? Like, were you a dinosaur kid, history buff, or nature nerd? I'd probably say history out of those. I mean, I probably played with dinosaurs stuff as a kid, but really interest-wise was probably history. Went to a lot of historical sites as a kid. My first probably anthropology, archaeology memory or experience is probably going to the effigy mounds in Iowa. It probably had to be when I was six or seven at a very young age. I vaguely have a memory, you know, recollection of being there, but not obviously remembering much of the history or the information about the native peoples, but just that memory at a very early age going to that uh, National Historic Site. And when I grew up in Iowa and then going other places, history sites, my interest in history probably was driven a lot just by through kind of a genealogical research. And my parents had done a lot of research into our family history which goes back on my mom's side to uh, the, the Mayflower. And then my dad's side came over to Boston in early 1630s and then into Pennsylvania with William Penn. So a lot of early American colonial history and then very much a family that kept migrating westward on the frontier. So got a lot of uh, interest in the history that way through that familial connection. Gotcha. Are you a member of the Sons of the American Revolution for any chance? I am a member of the Sons of American Revolution. I think the, what, the War of 1812 Society and the uh, Mayflower, General Society of Mayflower Descendants. And what's the other silly one I joined? The oh, Sons of Union Veterans of uh, the, the Civil War to uh, yeah. kind of try to research again and keep those organizations that are focused on historical and, and commemorating historical sites uh, viable. Yeah, I got deep ties to Virginia. So we're part of that. The Jamestown Organization. Sons of the American Revolution and Sons of uh, the, the Union one as well. And I'm not fam- like, I just know I have the memberships for it, but I'm not very involved. Kind of with that said, though, your first, like your undergraduate degree is in political science from Drake University. What was the original goal, man? 
I guess when I when I went to uh, college, obviously I'm uh, returning to academia at a, at a, after a career in the military. That uh, I think when I originally went to college, uh, went to Drake, I really uh, wasn't even planning and joining the military. I hadn't really ever talked to a recruiter or anything. I had planned to go get a law degree, and Drake University had a program that you could do your senior year as your first year of law school. So basically, in six years, you know, you could condense the normal seven year law school pipeline. And then I had taken, was taking summer school classes and taking 16 or 18 credit hours each semester. And so I was basically going to try to do a law degree in five years. I was on track to do that. So I joined a fraternity and a couple of the guys in the house were in ROTC and they're like, hey, we have these entry uh, freshman, sophomore uh, classes that you can take for one or two credit hours, you know, no obligation. You didn't really have to do anything but go to class uh, once a week for a couple hours, you know, pretty easy A's. So I was like, oh, credit hours, you know, let me do that. Took those, enjoyed it. Uh, I was actually going to school when the first Gulf War uh, took place in 1990, and got involved with it then and enjoyed the initial stuff. One second year, did some more classes and they had me apply for a scholarship. And I ended up getting a two year scholarship, still wasn't sure I was going to take it and, you know, go after it. Uh, even just a few years in, in the Army in a commission. They came back at my winter break, my sophomore year, and they're like, hey, we'll pay for your uh, full third year, your your sophomore year also, if you uh, contract. And so I had a couple of weeks over winter break to decide. And uh, I've generally gone with just usually taking opportunities that they present themselves. I don't know if it's a belief in a higher power or whatever, but uh, and just kind of gone with the opportunities when things arise, even if it's not necessarily the course I thought it was on. And I did it, figured I'd do four years uh, on active duty at, at most and, you know, go back and pursue a law degree or whatever else came up. And the next thing uh, next thing I knew, I was commissioned. And uh, 22 years later, I uh, retired from the Army. And as I said, at what I thought was going to be a few years at best. And, and uh, obviously a great experience and don't regret any of it. And, and glad I made that course change. Now I got to ask, what fraternity were you in in undergrad? Sigma Phi Epsilon. Sigap. You're a Sigap dude? I didn't know that. I am. Man, I'm a Sigap. I'm so oh, excited right now. Yeah, dude. Oh, right. I know it's small coincidence. I was, like, I was like, Drake, I know there's a Sigap chapter there. And I was like, why? Yeah, I would know that, dude. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Excellent. Yeah, my chapter, like, we still have a lot of ROTC kids back home in Virginia. Like, a lot of our guys are either soccer players or ROTC. Yeah, I've been working with the uh, – they're trying to re-charter uh, the chapter here at CSU, and so I've been working a little bit as I can time I can with the effort here that SIGEP and the alumni board here has on, on recolonizing. They've got a colony now. Uh, so yeah. Approval in the next year to re-chap charter. I did a little bit of help with the Colorado Gammas when I got to Wyoming for a little bit. You didn't go to yeah. Conclave, did you? No, I did not. I was in Denver. Wait, Anyways, back to anthropology. It's, it's called just Conclave? Like, um, <laughs> of all, of all, things, of all a, things to call it is Conclave. Do you, is there some white smoke involved and in a dead old person? No, it's, there's a laser light show. We send awards. It's great. <laughs> just of all the names you could choose. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a whole it's a whole. It's thing. left over from like 1900 when that's what you called conventions. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Okay, that that makes sense. Our fraternity like, was founded by like seven kids getting at a Southern Baptist University in Richmond, Virginia. Like it's you know. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you do basic training at? Well, I did uh, for ROTC. Since I was in the ROTC, I went to uh, an advanced camp in the summer at uh, my junior year. You go for about well, six or seven weeks, and it was at Fort Lewis, Washington. My training as when I got commissioned, I spent my initial training at as an officer basic course at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. And then later on for my infantry officer advanced course, I went to uh, at Fort Benning. Uh, so I've been my, on a uh, scenic tour of the uh, Army. Not so nice post. I'll use that word. Uh, I've my, my really good friend was went to Fort Benning and did not have a lot of nice things to say about that area. And the summer's there. <laughs> Yeah, definitely the summers. And if you're a trainee at Fort Benning, especially in basic training or AIT, it, it was not a very fun time. I, I did my, I spent a summer there in, uh, for uh, airborne school when I was in ROTC. And uh, yeah, July and August at Fort Benning are, are not a nice experience. Yeah, but between just, the hum, humidity, bugs, and just 
Oh, gosh. So you spent 22 years in the military. What kind of made you want to stay in it and kind of continue enlisting and extending that? Mostly, uh, probably twofold. One, the jobs I had. I spent my first six or seven years as a short range air defense officer, Stinger Missiles. And I was in a unit that was initially at, worked at core. So it was very much kind of an in, independent operations and working with other units. And, and it wasn't, uh, so I like enjoyed that. Uh, and also kind of the strategic look that we had at that level that I was working in, uh, deployed a lot of places, uh, spent uh, six months in Saudi Arabia, living in Riyadh. After they blew up uh, Kobar Towers in the 90s, we went over as a security force. So did that. And then I spent two years in Korea, 99 to 2001, as a uh, company commander of a uh, about a 200, uh, 220 man air defense Stinger missile unit in Korea. That was a great experience. Again, it was a divisional asset. So I was pretty much my own boss working with other people. Obviously, I had a lieutenant, I was a captain, but I had a lieutenant colonel that was my boss. But I was on my base by myself. He was; they were at a different base. So I like that level of uh, independence and, and kind of flexibility. It was nice being overseas. Is probably what kept me in and being over places where even before the war post nine eleven, but being in places where there were real world kind of focus and missions. When you're worrying about uh, North Koreans, it's a lot easier to put up with the, some of the hardships <laughs> versus if you're sitting back and you know somewhere in the El Paso or Fort Benning or Fort Bragg doing all the training without that real world enemy on, on the horizon. So I like that. And then after uh, I did my company commanding career, I went to uh, back to Fort Bragg to John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center to become a psychological operations officer, basically a propagandist, and really enjoyed that. And then again, I went back to Korea and spent uh, another 12 years in Korea, living in Korea, working with the Korean uh, psychological operations units, the Korean military, and again, very much in a independent, working at higher levels, working with the Korean government, Korean military, and uh, very much enjoyed that. And I think it's really what kept me in. And again, that mission focus of being over there, worried about, you know, what was coming up, could come down from the north. I was there when the missile, a lot of the missile tests occurred, the first nuke test. I was uh, working as the PSYOP officer for the four-star commander. So, being in a lot of that world was very interesting and uh, get me in. Yeah, I mean, you were definitely in Korea during some very interesting times. The death of Kim Jong Il or Kim, what was the last? It was Kim Jong Un Il. Kim Jong Il was the uh, the father. Uh, uh, Kim, Kim Jong Un is the current quote unquote leader. <laughs> yeah, and then granddad is Kim Il Sung, right? Yeah, Kim Il Sung, who died gotcha. in the mid nineties, early nineties. Well, good stuff. So, after twenty two years, what made you? pursue a, a master's degree? Because you ended up going for two masters at the same time, right? Like one at, is it American University, a history in, in, at American? Uh, American Military University. So when I was yeah. uh, getting ready to retire, it came clear retiring out of Korea was going to be too complicated. Just some of the processes. I'd been overseas and had stuff in storage back at Bragg for like 10 years in some army contracted warehouse and, and just getting everything and there are some jobs you're limited. Some government job benefits are limited if you're hired overseas, if there's a break between when you retire and, and when you're hired. So I was looking initially at retiring and doing an international relations program because I'd spent so much time in Korea. My wife's Korean. My son was born in uh, Wujambu, just north of Seoul. So I went back to uh, Fort Riley for a couple years to uh, retire, do all the kind of process. And I uh, started doing a, some online master's classes. I tried a couple of times during my career and just never really got the classes started, finished something. Last time I tried and it was right when Kim started the nuke tests and I got a little occupied in some other things than uh, doing grad classes. So uh, I ended up getting a C5C neck, C5C6 neck fusion right before I retired. That was my parting gift. I went to find the gold watch and somehow got in the wrong line and they stuck metal in my uh, neck instead. And so I couldn't literally couldn't lift anything over like 10 pounds for four to six months. And so I just had a lot of free time and the army gave me a lot of time, obviously being retiring, I didn't have a lot to do uh, in the States. I had a lot of time at my hands re recuperating and even after I retired. So I started taking classes and I ended up taking so many that uh, 
classes that I couldn't transfer all the credits and it just came easier to do a finish the online thesis track at American Military University. And then I, when I came to CSU, then instead of doing a thesis track here at CSU in history, I did a public history, which also I had a pretty strong interest in doing historic preservation and museum studies, kind of broadening my skill set. And really what led me kind of the archaeology as well as looking at, you know, what can I learn and, and broaden the skill set versus just getting another uh, history degree, which would, you know, if you've taken 36 credit hours of graduate history classes, uh, another 36, you're really not learning new skills. You're just diving into more of the same. And uh, I'd taken a historic archaeology class, and that kind of led me to the uh, CSU PhD program, which happened, again, kind of those opportunities popping up when you don't expect them. CSU, right as I was graduating from the MA program, and Jason LaBelle was on my committee for my master's, and I'd taken a class from Mary, and she was the grad coordinator at that time, started uh, their PhD program in 2018, right, as I was coming out of my MA program. And so it kind of seemed like uh, another fortuitous opportunity. And I uh, jumped at that. And now I guess four years later, here we are. Very interesting. And I think we'll we'll end right there. And uh, we'll come back in the next segment and talk about some of your research and uh, what you're studying up there at CSU. So this is episode 87 of a Life in Ruins podcast. And we will catch you in the second segment. And welcome back to episode 87. We're here with Ray Sumner. So Ray, why did you end up choosing Colorado State University for that PhD? I really ended up at Colorado State initially in my MA program because my thesis research was on the Powell expedition. John Wesley Powell uh, came out to Colorado in 1867, 68 on his first two expeditions. And then in 1869, went down the uh, Colorado uh, Green River from uh, Green River, Wyoming, down the Colorado River, down the Col- what became the Colorado River at the time was the Grand River and then became the Colorado River. As it went through the Grand Canyon, it made the first, quote unquote, at least in hyphens, at least intentional descent of the Grand Canyon on, on an exploration. So I had gotten into back to family research. My great grandfather, uh, second great grandfather had been Powell's lead guide in 67, 68 and then had been his lead boatman and guide in 69 down the Colorado River. And so when I was doing research on where to go and and do a history program, Colorado State had a a good Western history program. So that led me here because it was close to doing research in uh, Colorado, spent a lot of time in Grant County uh, doing work uh, throughout the state uh, on topics of Western history. And then again, kind of when CSU uh, started the anthropology uh, PhD program, and it was also very spatially based, which uh, I did I had done a lot of work in and looking at things spatially and how they related. It seemed like a natural fit. Initially, I had started to uh, plan on doing my PhD research in related topics of his, the 1860s, 1870s period in uh, Western Colorado on the Western Slope. As I started uh, doing research and going into the program, looking at topics in the summer of 2018, even before really starting classes, that summer, I volunteered with Dr. LaBelle on the field school uh, and we went out to Rangeley, visited a lot of the museums, talking to people, seeing what assets were available in private collections, museum collections, and then also talking to the land, federal land managers and got, to, in retrospect, some sage advice, uh, topics and how many different entities you want involved in your timelines. And that coordinating on the Western Slope from Colorado State, where you got to cr- takes out about three to five months of the year when you can get to the Western Slope to do research and to do work. Uh, And then on the Western Slope, almost all of the land you'd be working on would be federal uh, land. And so it would take, obviously, the federal coordination process on top of then coordinating with mostly the Northern Ute tribe. And, of course, they're now located in uh, Fort Deschaines in Utah, seven, eight hours. So just kind of looking at the logistical challenges that that might present. So started looking at other possibilities. And uh, Dr. LaBelle and I took a trip to the uh, 150th anniversary of Beecher Island, the Battle of Beecher Island in uh, September 2018. On the way back, we swung by Julesburg, kind of making it a Plains conflict kind of tour and drove past the battlefield and they have some uh, interpretive markers and then stopped at their museum. It's really a pretty... uh, fascinating little museum for a town of 1600 that they have related to the history of the town, but also the battle. And that kind of got me down looking at, Hey, nobody's really worked on Julesburg. Uh, 
not really even professional archaeologists, whether it's commercial or academic, and same for historians. It's all been avocational types, and that kind of led me to that and staying at CSU and going through the uh, PhD program. Excellent. I'm fascinated with your dissertation. I mentioned that in segment one. So could you, for the audience, tell us what your dissertation topic is about? Yeah, I started referring to it, I guess it was probably 2819 as the days after Colorado's darkest day. And that came out of, we, I ended up, did a poster at a graduate student showcase here at CSU on something completely unrelated. But out of that got into the, uh, Three minute challenge selection group of about 30 to 5 to 40 people every year, grad students for the uh, vice president of research fellows program. And you basically give a three minute pitch with one slide on your topic. And in that, so I was trying to think of a, somehow I stumbled across calling my research the days after Colorado's darkest day. And it's that because Sand Creek obviously is one of the darkest days in the state's history, territorial history. And so to make the distinction that What you don't hear about is what happened after the Sand Creek Massacre. And actually, uh, it's rather fortuitous we're talking about this, as today is the anniversary of November 29th, 1864, and uh, obviously the darkest day in the state's history, uh, with the massacre of Black Kettle and the other Cheyenne and Arapaho that were at the village at Sand Creek uh, at that time. But to make the distinction that I'm not looking at Sand Creek, but researching what happened in the aftermath, what happened starting November 30th and in the pursuing weeks and months. And if you visit Sand Creek, even what really fascinated me is that even down there, uh, they'll talk about how things related from Sand Creek. You get the little bighorn, but there's almost no mention of the events of 1865, especially January and February in Nebraska, Kansas and uh, Wyoming in the early months, uh, which is really sad because the Cheyenne and Arapaho uh, go and join with the Lakota, primarily the Ogallala and the Sigangu, if I'm pronouncing my uh, poor pronunciation today, of the Lakota Sioux. And they join together and go on a military campaign, which I would argue, against the, the targets up and down the North and South Platte, primarily in Colorado. And, and to me, it's really fascinating. And one, it shows that, A, they weren't completely destroyed. You know, the Cheyenne and Arapaho didn't disappear after Sand Creek. Shivington and the Colorado militia attacked a primarily just a village of elders. You know, obviously there were people with weapons there, uh, not um, that fought back, rightfully so. But it was not the main warrior societies of the Cheyenne. So all Shivington, beyond the moral and ethical, obviously atrocities and ethical issues with the whole attack in itself, it was a complete military blunder. And, and one thing I recently stumbled across a few years ago was a, a telegram from uh, General Connor from Utah, who had been tasked by D.C. to come out and take over the Overland Trail stage route in Nebraska and Colorado and into Wyoming as an area defense to stop the the raids and the attacks that had been going on in in 1864, primarily in eastern Nebraska. Uh, But Connor, on uh, the 21st of November, sent a telegram back to the uh, department or the War Department at the time and basically said, there's not enough troops here. We don't need to uh, try to persecute any uh, military campaign against the Plains Indians at this time. All that'll do is stir up problems that we can't control. And it sends that back and says, my my cavalry got stuck at Bridger because of early snows. I'll be back in the spring and lays out basically exactly what will happen if you do what Shivington did at Sand Creek. And of course, right after Sand Creek, exactly what Connor foretold happening is what happened on the plains throughout it really not just 1865 really goes on until uh, little bighorn and so my research is looking into that period after sand creek and primarily starts with what i call the first battle of julesburg and so after uh, sand creek the cheyenne and arapaho meet up with various bands of the lakota and they have a war council in eastern uh, western kansas near saint francis on cherry creek and decide to have a military act reaction to the Sand Creek Massacre. And they really choose Julesburg. And this is where I think I, I kind of view it as obviously I'm not trying to present that I'm a native Cheyenne or Rapo or Lakota that and account for things exactly as they would have in their mindset. But I do think in a lot of ways coming at it from a military planner who planned campaigns 
for the U.S. military, joint operations, looking at how you fight wars, regardless of whether you're an American or Russian, there is somewhat of a military science to that and a way of how, you know, I see the world having spent 27, 28 years from the time in ROTC viewing military operations where you look at things through a military lens. And so when I started to look at how the Cheyenne and the Arapaho and what they were doing, it normally got kind of, uh, you in the little bit of history, when you do see it talked about, it's viewed as basically, you know, they went out and killed every white man they could see on, on the trail. I'm sure there was no love lost for uh, after Sand Creek and the other atrocities that had taken place and, you know, fighting for resources between the, the settlers, the military and the tribes. But when they were selecting things, as you look at it through a military planner's lens, they're doing things for very specific reasons, not simply going out and attacking and killing every single person that they can find. And Julesburg won the first attack at Julesburg on January 7th, 1865, is a great example. And what they're doing is they're trying to conduct what I would call from a military perspective a raid. They're going and attacking the Overland Stage warehouses at Julesburg because they need the supplies that are in the warehouses. They need the corn. They need that the, uh, the cattle that they're taking on the trail. They need cloth for clothing. They need material canvas to make teepees and tents because they have those four to 500 survivors of the Sand Creek Massacre who now have nothing in January. They have no food stores. They don't, they don't have blankets, chairs, robes, cooking utensils. So they're attacking these ranches and stage stations, gaining supplies to provision those survivors for the remainder of the winter of 1865 until they can get into the summer hunting seasons where they can go through their more traditional supply routes. Obviously, there's not a lot of buffalo that you can uh, obtain in, in the wintertime. You're also then, if you're killing buffalo in the winter, you, you risk you know killing off calves from the next season. So being aware of that, they're attacking Julesburg for that reason. And, and the close proximity of the Army Fort Camp Rankin that later becomes Fort Sedgwick is a prime example. They attack the stage station and wagon trains. They harass the fort. But they never try to overrun the fort itself because they have no interest in killing every single soldier inside the fort because it doesn't serve any of their military objectives and the reasons they're conducting the operations. Then they go on for about six weeks raiding different stage stations and ranches up and down the trail, burning virtually every one between Fort Morgan and almost North Platte in Nebraska. But when they come back to Julesburg for the second time in 1865 on February 2nd, they this time attack the stage station, harass the fort. The cavalry doesn't come out, but they go back, raid the warehouses. They raid Walmart again, as I jokingly say, because it's been resupplied. But this time they know they're going north into to the uh, Nebraska, eventually up towards Dakotas and over into the Powder River region. This time they know they're not coming back, so they actually burn the warehouses completely at Julesburg because, again, it doesn't serve a future military purpose. Um, and, and then in showing it in a larger context, I hope to kind of do, I'm doing a lot of archaeology there to locate sites in the specific battle locations, Julesburg area for the two battles, but also trying to contextualize it at what they're doing at the operational and strategic level. Uh, it's kind of a levels of war analysis that Doug Scott has done some work on at the battles at Mud Springs that come right after and uh, Rush Creek that happened the week after the second battle of Julesburg. But then really to look at as a, the whole entire period of 1865 from not as an American military planner or a native military planner, but looking at the actions and how they relate together. And again, normally they're viewed as independent actions based on what the U.S. military is doing. U.S. military attacked Sand Creek. U.S. military was attacked at Julesburg. Connor attacks into the Powder River. But I think when you look at all of the things and look at who the different players are on the U.S. cavalry military side, as well as then on the Native American, the Cheyenne, Lakota, and Arapaho side, it's the vast majority of many of the same players throughout. So I think it's really, in the end, I'm arguing that it's really an interrelated campaign throughout 1865, where Sand Creek is the initial action by the U.S. military. The reaction is what the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota do throughout 1865, January up into September, August, September, when General Connor then has the counter reaction 
which is the Powder River Expedition in 1865, which basically is a draw for both sides. So in a kind of a nutshell, that's uh, what I'm looking at as a conflict kind of and a historical archaeology. So I am aware that in the spring of 1865, the Pawnee Scouts were back in action, especially in the Powder River campaign. Um, and this is a point where um, at least my nation gets gets involved in, in what's going on in the West, being enlisted by the United States military to serve as uh, scouts. And then also we kind of just got involved ourselves. We weren't supposed to, but you couldn't stop us. Well, yeah. And on that, this is where another thing, there's so much early history and it probably would take a couple more PhDs by some historians and others that it, I think it raises a lot of interesting questions. You know, when does the Civil War end? These are all Civil War soldiers. I don't think a lot of the tension on the plains happened without the Civil War. I think things would have probably progressed different, differently, probably if career military had been here versus mobilized and different resources available. But yeah, it's really the, the conflict in 1864 gives birth to the Pawnee Scouts. They come out with General Mitchell on some of the early expeditions in the immediate aftermath of some of the hostilities in 1864 and then are at Julesburg in response to the uh, battle in uh, January and February. And all that's glossed over. And when you dig into the ethnography of the various bands that are involved, many of the later leaders of the conflict in the mid 1870s are involved in the conflict at Julesburg as younger warriors, not as as of uh, shirt wearers or what other titles people might give them war leaders. But they're the the soldiers at those battles, and I think a lot of that's where they learn some of the tactics that work and some of the tactics that don't, and get that first realization that they can stand up to the U.S. military. Of course, unfortunately, on their side, that the Civil War ends in April and all of a sudden you have battle-hardened troops in the thousands being sent west, uh, which changes that dynamic greatly as well as the supply. But I think all of those relations have just been kind of glossed over and not looked at the really the integral role this early period plays in setting the conditions for what happens later and a lot of ways how the U.S. decides to handle its Indian policy in its aftermath. Yeah, my um, my family name, Shield Chief, comes from a Pawnee Scout that we traced ascendancy from. And I, I don't remember if he was in the Cheyenne. I think he was in the Cheyenne War um, in 1866 when they had the most amount of scouts, when they had the Pawnee Battalion in, in play. Part of the reason why I'm so fascinated by your research is what you're looking at is a very much, as you said, glossed over all the details in between the big highlights, quote unquote, highlights of this time period, but everything in, in, in between is, is not really, really looked at. Everyone wants to talk about Sand Creek and Little Bighorn, the, the skirmishes and raids that happen in between, which, which are important to what's going on in Western politics are completely just not really mentioned. As you considered, right, like a lot of people will think of these actions as random and just out for blood for the purpose of blood and not actual in military intelligence taking place on behalf of so-called, you know, plain savages. But these people actually knew what they were doing and knew how to do it. Yeah. And Julesburg, I mean, the army had about 60, 55, 60 soldiers at best at Julesburg that day, about 40, 45 go out in the first battle. And it was a very complex military operation that, that the Cheyenne Arapaho and, and the Lakota ran that they started and they attacked the mail coach coming in at like 3, 4 a.m., about four miles out. It didn't get the cavalry to come out. They're like, thanks, I'm not going out in the middle of the night, you know, trying to find people in the dark. The stage got to the stage station and was safe. Next, they moved in a couple more miles. They attacked a wagon train that was camped at a ranch about two miles from the forward a mile from the stage station. That got the cavalry to come out. They start chasing off 60 or 70 of the of the various members of the bands. They follow them up four miles into the sand hills, at which time George Ben talks about it in his book with Hyde, that a couple of the, the young braves come out early and all of a sudden the cavalry sees them and stops. And the next thing then, of course, the the, the group of uh, Cheyenne Arapaho and uh, Lakota come out and there's almost 1,500, 12 to 1,500 estimated warriors, which literally when I'm looking at the terrain to hide that, it would it'd have to be over about you know, five or six mile length. I mean, it would just, you'd have to spread those guys out basically from uh, Ovid, Colorado, where the exit is almost to the Julesburg exit, just to hide those people, that amount of people in the bluffs and not get seen. And so, you know, that's where the 15, majority of the 15 soldiers get killed that day, fighting their way back to get to the 
back to the ranch and back to the stage station and back to the fort. And they actually bring out some uh, artillery finally to uh, kind of a drive off the natives, Americans far enough to get the retreat. Cause obviously again, the native Americans weren't looking to kill every soldier. So they had no interest in trying to, you know, overpower and, and suffer 25 dead guys to take them out in howitzer. Uh, so they just let them go back to the fort. They hung out in the fort and they, uh, ransack the stage stage. That's that's super interesting and very cool. And and being from Colorado and around there, it's like you mentioned, you don't we don't learn about this in school or anything like that. So super interesting. And on that note, we were gonna end this segment and we'll catch you in the third segment. This is episode eighty seven of Life in Ruins Podcast. Chris Webster is about to soothe you with some awesome ads. Welcome back to episode 87 of a Life in Ruins podcast. We are here with Ray Sumner and we had talked a little bit about this on Dr. Alex Garcia Putnam's episode, but there is this program where archaeologists work with the Department of Defense to help not repatriate, but to recover remains of of people who have died in, in foreign wars and and things like that. And at CSU, they have a close relationship with the DOD through the Center for Environmental Management and Military Lands, um, where they employ archaeologists to do survey stuff, as well as this program. And Ray, you were a part of this during this last summer, or was it the summer before? Yeah, it was this uh, past summer. Um, and so, yeah, Semmel is an organization that was created, I think, about 35 years ago, uh, mid-late 80s at CSU to work with the Department of Defense on cultural resources, but also all the biological sciences, other environmental science type issues to help DOD meet their regulatory and, and legal requirements for projects. And so one of the, uh, I've worked with them since I was in my MA program on some historical preservation and have also then started working some archaeology, cultural resource uh, projects with them over the years. And their director, uh, Tony Chapa, is a uh, former uh, combat veteran, is a combat veteran, a former member of the U.S. military and so he's always had an interest in being involved and in helping DPA, the remains recovery, obviously being a retired military, uh, helping reunite uh, the missing in action, finding them and bringing them home and, and keeping that sacred trust is something that uh, we both had a great interest in. And so DOD uh, has, a, for many years, we're probably one of the only countries in the world that goes to the lengths we do and spends the money and time. Uh, to recover all of our missing in action from it, all the wars that we can. So in 2015, DOD, Congress created the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, DPAA, putting together a bunch of different parts of the Defense Department that were dealing with the, the uh, mission set of the missing in action. And so as part of that, they also allowed DPA to develop partnerships with universities and nonprofits to lo- help increase the capacity for the military to do these recoveries. And so the largest, if one of the largest, if not the largest anthropological forensic anthropology lab in the world is the DPA main laboratory in Hawaii. And now they have a second lab uh, that's opened recently in the last couple of years at off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, uh, where they employ uh, you know hundreds of people working in the uh, lab to uh, work on the missing in action. Uh, and they have military teams that go out and do recoveries. Uh, But to broaden that, they started, as I said, bringing in uh, academic institutions. And CSU worked over a couple of years to become one of their partners and develop a required uh, memorandums of agreement, understanding on how to do that. And this past year, we were able to uh, conduct a mission to France to go and try to locate a missing B-17G pilot that was shot down in a few weeks after uh, D-Day in early July 1819. I got to get on my historical uh, research. Uh, early 1944 uh, in northern France. Uh, eight members of the, the crew bailed out. Seven were captured. Uh, one, the French underground, got out. And so we were uh, tasked to go you know, to try and uh, locate this missing pilot. Very unique situation. In this case, the family had uh, gotten interested in the missing pilot a few years ago. Uh, they have a family member that was involved in the... Uh, U.S. military, and he had an opportunity on leave to visit the area and do some personal research and brought the case, uh, some of the connections he had made to DPA's uh, detachment in Germany, and they were able to carry it forward to the point where it could justify sending us in uh, this past summer. 
And so uh, we partnered with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to do the mission. Dr. Michelle Coons was our lead archaeologist on the ground that oversaw the work at the site. I was the team leader and project manager. So I was over all the logistics, the planning, coordination with DP, uh, DPAA before the mission, working it after, closing out all the finances afterwards, and then doing all the administrative logistics side of the house uh, to enable Michelle to focus on the uh, work on the site and leading our team. And so we, we kind of tried a different model. A lot of schools go in and do it through a model where they're using kind of the field school model to do that. Being a, a veteran and, and Tony Chapa being a veteran, we decided to try to use a smaller team, go in with a mo- more trained, more focused team of experienced uh, personnel and people with connection to the military in different ways that would help with the mission, we thought. And then we reached out to the uh, veterans community in France, to the American Legion and the VFW, to coordinate for veterans to come in for and other family members and such to come in and volunteer for five to seven, 10 days at the site to help out. Again, reducing costs to DPA to be able to bring people, more people to the problem set. And so we took 14 uh, people from the States, Dr. Coons, myself, uh, another one of our PhD students here at CSU, a biological anthropologist, took Dr. Uh, Aaron Baxter, that was also working at the museum. Uh, fortunately, uh, DMNS released both of them to go work on the project as part of the partnership. Then took uh, Amy Gillespie, uh, another trained uh, registered public archaeologist. So we had a very uh, solid core of trained archaeologists that worked the project. And then got uh, an additional uh, nine volunteers, three metal detecting subject matter experts from the states, along with six additional undergrads or recent grads that went from both CSU as well as University of Colorado, Colorado Springs to round out our volunteers from the states. And then we had about uh, 20, 25 partners in Europe come throughout the three weeks, the uh, missions on the ground to uh, look for the missing pilot, as well as then incorporating probably about 15 to 20 local residents came and wanted to be involved uh, with the recovery. To protect the site, uh, we don't obviously talk the specific details uh, of its location, but the little local farm community in northern France has uh, protected this site for 75 years. They're very invested and helped the family a great deal in their research and were were wonderful to us, uh, welcoming us in their homes, helping us with whatever we needed, coming out and volunteering to move dirt, 80% uh, humidity and 80, 85 degrees outside. uh, so it was a wonderful experience to do. So was it a B-17 or a B-24? This one was a B-17G. So obviously a four-engine large aircraft. We found debris across virtually what probably equates to about 80 football fields, 100 meters or 1,000 meters by almost 500 meters. And a lot of that, I would say that debris field is that size, not because it's that size definitively, but that's the only area that we checked. If we check some of the other permissions with property owners and went on, you'd probably see a bigger uh, debris field. Uh, And so really, it's a very unique archaeology. Obviously, your goal is to find evidence to help you locate the missing pilot so that he can be identified, returned through the French government to the United States government and identified through the DPA and the military uh, DNA laboratory uh, so that he can be reunited with his family members. And that's really one of the emotional things about this unique is even as a historical archaeologist where I can see names of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and the Lakota that are involved, obviously I could get lists of all the soldiers and most of the civilians that were at Julesburg at the time. But here it's, it's, there is actually a fam, family that, you know, you, you know a name on a piece of paper of who you're looking for. You, have, you can see their photographs. You see some of their personal effects they might have. In this case, uh, we were able before because the family had involved to learn what the fa- from the family member what he had learned in the research process, and it was his wife who's the grandniece. So it's you're really just you know one two generations away from this person that you're looking for. So it's really a unique form of archaeology to have that reality with the person, but then also to be involved, unique from how you normally would operate a dig. Here we were doing four meter by four meter excavation units. You're primarily looking for a very narrow uh, set of, of archaeological evidence from certain pieces of the aircraft that may help you identify the aircraft, may identify an area where you might think the cockpit is, where you think the we believe 
the pilot was at when the aircraft went down. And of course, then the reality of your, you may come across uh, human remains from the pilot, uh, remains of the pilot himself, where you know exactly, you know, the probability if that's human remains that very well could be the person you're looking for. And in this case, uh, where we only had the one individual, it was uh, kept that reality in the back of your mind at all times. It made it very, uh, I think everyone would agree, even the non-veteran, a very emotional kind of situation. Absolutely. And was this aircraft shot down going towards its target or on the way back? It was about two minutes uh, from its bomb release. Okay. And so it got hit going in. We believe uh, from the research and the, the historical record that it was a... Uh, Going in on bombing some V two related V one V two related targets uh, that were launching uh, out of northern uh, France at that time period, trying to get uh, into England. So most of the targets were around that kind of targets, either command and control or actual launch and other uh, information. It was, I believe, the second plane in formation. It broke out uh, once it was hit, uh, so it didn't explode and damage, which was its uh, SOP, and then crashed down. There's a lot of conflicting stories on you know did it nose dive. Did it veer away? Uh, so we had a lot of locals come by, and even one who was an actual child was still alive and was able to come by and tell us his impressions of the days after the crash, what he saw that day. So again, it was a very unique kind of uh, of, a, uh, of a project. So you didn't have to worry about unexplored ordnance. That's pretty pretty. Uh, like- no, it, well, it, it was a concern, and so uh, we would uh, again having the metal detectors uh, helped. Uh, we would always uh, they obviously were looking for artifacts. Throughout the site, and we found over 4,000, almost 4,500 artifacts that they located during the three weeks. But also, obviously, if you get a, uh, a ping, we did have some survey work that was done f- specifically looking for potential uh, EOD. Uh, we did find a lot. You would, of course, it being a bomber crash, you find a lot of 50 cal ammunition exploded, shot, casings, bullets, as well as complete rounds that haven't, haven't exploded. Uh, fortunately, those aren't really too dangerous. Most of the powder is uh, dry. For the larger uh, material, fortunately, it was a farm field that had been farmed for the last 75 years. And their plow zone is about 50 centimeters, they said. So uh, it was about the depth we were going. It was really where the soil horizon changed, about that depth. Uh, so in the most part, we were fairly confident in the areas we were digging uh, that we were safe. Being out of the military, we had a couple other guys that were vets that had EOD experience in terms of, identi- you know, I can identify a, a, a 500 pound bomb enough to tell us to get the hell away from it and call in the French EOD. Uh, we did have ties with the French uh, Department of Interior's demining group and they would come out to site and visit it and did some assessments for us as well. Uh, so we had procedures in place for safety. But when you first get there and see the, uh, you could still see on the farm field just south of where we were at, the craters that were in the side of this hill from World War II, from the bombing that at the other V2 sites that were in the area. And we had aerial imagery from right before the crash. Uh, and you could see all of the bomb craters in the field that we were in. Uh, so it did place in the back of your mind that it was always a uh, remote and limited possibility, but still a possibility that you could stumble across because you still see it every day that they're running across every week, probably in Northern France in the low countries, you know, coming across ordnance from, World War Two and probably even more scarier crap from World War One. Absolutely, and for our audience, V ones and V twos are the earliest, basically cruise missiles. They're rockets that were developed by Werner von Braun, who then became the head of NASA. And the first U.S. rocket was a V two with an American flag on it, rather than a swastika. So, history is fun. Yeah, it was a fascinating area to be in too. Just in northern France, as a slight aside, is I. Now, I've never really gotten very deep into World War I history, and definitely not the prior to the American involvement. I mean, I know all the big battles being in the military, military officer history classes, but the little the hotel we were staying in, we stayed about 40 minutes away in a town called Arras, just because of not being able to do a recon and COVID and things like that. We chose to go with a uh, Western brand hotel just kind of for safety and knowing what we we're getting uh, going in blind. But Aris was the site of a major World War I battle. And so there's all these monuments and all these historical sites around this area. And the Battle of Aris had like 300,000 people killed in it over this month. And I had never even heard of it. You're just, you know, they're so when hundreds of thousands of people can die in a battle or be wounded, and it's not even on the radar screen because of how 
the Marne and Bella Wood and all these others, how, how even worse, all these other battles where it just was kind of eye opening to the, uh, to the level of, uh, of what went on there and to see that there are British Commonwealth, I should say, cemeteries all throughout that area of Northern France. And, uh, just really to see the, I mean, really brings home how much the loss was to the French, the British, and obviously the Germans as well, fighting in World War One. that, you know, we can't even comprehend the impact it had on the, the, their countries. Well, thank you so much, Ray, for coming on and, and chatting with us about this stuff. You know, it's it's really interesting. We don't, we haven't had anyone who does historical military archaeology. Ray, thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. Um, and so before we end, what are a couple sources? These could be books, articles, videos, blogs, even that you would recommend for anyone interested in the archaeology of conflict, the Indian Wars, historical archaeology, or I mean, how even World War II at this point? I think I think uh, the first couple I'd mention uh, from a historical archaeology, conflict archaeology, related to the Julesburg kind of campaign period, I'd recommend uh, Battle Space 1865. It's by Doug Scott, Peter Bleed, and Amanda Renner. And it, it's a really it's a very short book, uh, looks at the aftermath of the battles in, in Nebraska right after the Battle of Jul- Second Battle of Julesburg. But really engageable. It also presents kind of the strategic, operational, and tactical, the levels of war analysis that I'm using in my research. Uh, and Doug Scott has been a great help to me in, in providing advice and guidance uh, whenever I've reached out to him. And then also, if you're going to look into historical conflict archaeology, especially Plains, lack of a better term, Indian War archaeology, I'd really also recommend Archaeological Insights in the Custer Battle, an assessment of the 1984 fieldwork season. And that's really Doug Scott and Richard Fox Jr.'s initial book on their work at the Battle of Little Bighorn when they were able to do research after the fires that occurred there in the early 1980s. Really some foundational work. And a lot of that work that Doug Scott has done is where conflict archaeology using forensics, kind of like the CSI, looking at the weapons, their ranges, where they're found, their clustering really looking at firearms analysis and really got it started and is, is invaluable into what I and everybody else is doing in conflict archaeology today. And both of those are very short and engageable. Uh, another one I, re- I found, it's really two books I found, and they actually just won an award from the Plain Center there at the uh, University of uh, uh, Nebraska-Lincoln are by uh, Leo Killsback, who is a uh, Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne, I believe. But he wrote a two-set uh, series on the Cheyenne, which were fascinating to see an internal tribal perspective from someone who's also a trained anthropologist, academic background, uh, and being able to bridge that kind of uh, world and writing them from a native perspective, Cheyenne perspective, but also in an academic kind of engage the way academics are used to engaging with the information. Both are very fascinating books. and I've used them a lot as reference to trying to understand the Cheyenne. And um, I think it's really important too, because the Cheyenne, it's amazing uh, when you dig into their governance system, not going to a lot of it, but it was a uh, very much had a, even a civilian military control. And we throw back to uh, Sand Creek. That's something that uh, Shivington by destroying multiple bands of the leadership of bands at Sand Creek, he breaks that civilian military control and puts the warrior societies in really the driving seat through much of 1865-68, through 1865-69 period with the, the conflict in Colorado. And so those are definitely books I'd recommend for readers to work. And then there's another uh, Lakota traditionalist and historian who's been fascinating named Marshall uh, that's wrote a lot of historical fiction as well as his, uh, perspectives on Lakota viewpoints. I'd really uh, reach out. I think it's Marshall the Third. I'm mind blanking on his first name at the moment, but another great source perspectives on how things are viewed from the Lakota. Awesome. And for our listeners, they those will be in the show notes. Um, there'll be links to those and uh, citations as well. And where can our, our listeners find you on social media? I have a Facebook site that we use for the project. It's called the Julesburg Project. Uh, so if you search on Facebook at the Julesburg Project or at Camp Rankin 1865, it should pop up for you. That's the primary means. Uh, we do also uh, post on the CSU Department of Anthropology and Geography's website, as well as the Center for Mountain and Plains Archaeology that Dr. LaBelle runs for some of the more uh, 
prominent information, but for the nitty gritty and a lot more detailed information, the project site on uh, Facebook is the best place to go. Perfect. And because the show is a life in ruins, we have to ask you a very important question. So if you were given the chance again, would you still choose to live a life in ruins? Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, archaeology, especially. uh, And for me, a historical archaeology really has blended all of my interests. It's put history, it's put my military career together, together, and being able to bring that together and hopefully look at things from a perspective, somewhat of a descendant community of the military, and give perhaps some new uh, insights to bringing things together and understanding how and why people from both sides of the conflict did things and not look at it simply through one lens or another uh, lens from the opposite side of the battle. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today, Ray. Really appreciate it, man. So everyone, we just uh, interviewed Ray Sumner, PhD candidate at Colorado State University. Um, You can find him on Facebook at the Julesburg Project and Camp Rankin 1865, as well as CSU Department of Anthropology and Geography at the Center for Mountain and Plains Archaeology. Uh, Facebook sites. So yeah, definitely go check them out. And please, 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 everybody rate our podcast wherever you listen. If you're listening to us on the all shows feed, subscribe to our podcast so we can actually see those downloads and tell our producers what good boys we've been. Don't forget, we have a website. You can always email us. We're always down for suggestions. We've got a couple. We're excited uh, to do a deep dive into alpha. So we definitely need dog boy David to be on for that one. We have a merch store, buy some merch. Buy you know, stickers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Put the stickers. Do do the thing. We Ray, did you. I give you a sticker at Plains? I don't think you did. I did it at a bar that I don't even remember the name <laughs> of. Oh, dude, yes. Uh, Jaeger. But yeah, I, I went into Plains with like a Jaeger. pocket full of stickers. And Lana's like, why are you doing that? I was like, well, people listen to the podcast. I'll hand them out. And like, just sure enough, like all these kids started surrounding me. And I was just, at, and then I was out of stickers. So next time. SAAs, everyone. Come find us. We'll give you stickers. We'll be So, there. and with that, we are out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So the last time we visited the Eastern Plains, we took a picture of a field of wheat. Turned out really grainy. Thank you, Connor. Ray's confused. He's just (laughs) visibly confused. (laughs) All right, we're out. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network. And was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.